in a positive way, because the point is we are not here just to complain, but actually to put forth uh, solutions. After all, this is uh, Ghana, Ghana rising. And there is nothing new under the sun. I believe some, some wise man said that. Which means that what has been done by other people, we can also do. I found uh, Michael's um, presentation fascinating, especially about uh, cultural competitiveness. And I would like us, Michael, I'm inviting you to dinner one evening of your choice, and we will sit down and talk about cultural competitiveness. You know, let me tell you a story. Many years ago, uh, when I was president of AGI, there was this young man who was coming from Kumase, and he was a, a manufacturer of leather sandals. And any time he came for council meetings, he would come with a bag of 10 pairs or something, leather sandals, and try to sell it to members of the council, you know. And once he came, and nobody bought any of it. So he approached me and said, President, today nobody bought any of my um, sandals. And I said, so? He said, cried." Uh, so I had to give him some money. But then it occurred to me, why does he have to carry his sandals to sell? So I called him the following day and told him that I was going to arrange shelf space for him. So I called Tema, Tema uh, Bachona Mobile, it was in those days, owned by uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Yao, and said, look, there is this young AGI man who is doing um, sandals. Can you give him shelf space? So he said, yes, let him bring the things. So I asked him to go and see him. He took about 20 pairs of sandals. And that evening when I was leaving Tema for Accra, I drove by the, the, the uh, Bachona Mobile to find out what was happening. And I asked, so how many pairs of his sandals have you sold today? And he said, no, we haven't sold any. I said, are you sure? The amount of traffic which passes through this place Let's go into the shop and let me see. We went into the shop, and the sandals had been placed in some corner, bottom shelf, somewhere. I told my friend that, no. Can you please move his sandals? I pointed out a shelf by the side, at least within eye level, and said, can you put his, his sandals there? Within the week, the 20 pairs were sold. That is not the end of the story. They called him to bring more. He brought another 20 pairs. So he had a good business going. Then one day, I ran into him and asked, so how is the Sanders business going? He said, oh, now he's thinking of employing two or three people. I said, well, that's good. Keep me posted how it's going. About a year down the line, he calls me and says he needs money. I said, what do you need money for? He said, oh, his business. I said, but the business is doing well. I hear anything you bring, they are selling. So if you need money, go to your bank. This is the time for you to talk to your bank. And then he says, actually, what happened was that uh, he was making money through but he's going to buy a piece of land. I said, what? You have taken the money from your business to buy a piece of land? What, what, why, why would you do that? Why aren't you putting the money back into the business and growing the business? One day, you wouldn't need to buy a piece of land. You can buy a house. He said, no, but he got into a, a little discussion back and forth. He obviously, Ashanti man, he didn't agree with me. He thought that once he was making money, he should start building, building a house, you know. So this is cultural competitiveness for you. <laughs> I 
I'll tell you a second one. When I started Tropical Cable, one of the first major contracts that I got, we had gone into a tender with a major uh, utility. We had been informed that we had won the tender and that um, the contract was to be signed. I had been invited, gone to the offices, and signed my portion of the contract. Now, it was left for the relevant officials on the other side to sign. The first person had signed, and it was on the desk of the second person. And for something like a month, I was going every week, and he hadn't signed it. And I was wondering, why isn't he signing it? So I had one of my brain waves. My, I had, a, I had a, a consultant, a BISO consultant, Englishman who was coming here every time to help us with the technology and things. So one day I told him, Tom, can you put on your suit and follow me? He said, what are we going to do? He's, he's, he's a technical person, you know. He said, yes, I have a suit, but um, what do you want me? I said, don't say anything. Just come along with me. So I took Tom, and we drove to the offices, and I, we went up, and I told the secretary to the gentleman that my white man has come, you see, <laughs> in connection with the contracts. And so, uh, 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 so, and they had this div division between the offices, so I could hear her. She went and told him that, hey, I think you see, I need to bring And she, I mean, to cut a long story short, we left the office with a signed contract. <laughs> because I had gone with my brother number. But he, had not, he was my consultant. I was paying him to work for me. Yes. He was my employee. But that is, the, that is why I want to have this conversation about cultural competitiveness. Not to swap these stories, because I have dozens of them, but to see how we can resolve some of these issues. Because really, if we want to make a change, we have to. And there must be a way to do it, because there is nothing new under the sun. The phrase, capturing the commanding heights of the economy, was first introduced in Ghana, for those of us who are old enough to remember, by a cool maker called Kutua Champon. In 1972, he had made a coup d'etat. And as one of his justifications for making the coup, he said that the commanding heights of our economy were in the hands of foreigners. And so, that was one of the reasons why he had made the coup. He went on to, he had a number of, I think there were about seven of them, tenets of the revolution. One nation, one, uh, one country, one nation, one people. It was during his time that our national pledge was first put together. I promise on my honor to be faithful and loyal. He, 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 did, he, did, he did all those things, you know. The funny thing is that amongst the other reasons he, he gave for the coup was that the few amenities they used to enjoy as soldiers had been taken away from them. <laughs> Among the actions he took to capture the commanding heights of the economy, and he didn't just say it, he came out with certain policies to capture, and one of them, you know, was the partial, partial nationalization of certain assets, national assets, and one of it was Ashanti Gold. You know, originally, Ashanti Gold was founded by three Ghanaians, if you read the history of Ashanti Gold. And after they, they got the 100 square mile of, of land in the Obuasi area. But they passed it on to an European group who promptly took it, took it over. So by this time, Ashanti Gold, when Kutua Champon became head of state after his coup in 1972, was owned by a foreign company with offices in London. In fact, their operational offices were not in Ghana. It was in London. So 
he did a partial nationalization of Ashanti Gold, along with some other, some other, other companies, you know. Fast forward to today, so he took over the, the, the company, majority shares. It's Ashanti Gold, uh, 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 majority Ghanaian owned. No, it is back majority foreign owned. And I have traced the history of this sentiment of capturing the commanding heights of the economy, not just to show the cyclical nature of these sentiments, you know. But more importantly, I want to demonstrate that capturing any height is not as important as maintaining the height captured. If the captured height is giving up for some temporary advantage or short-term gain, as unfortunately happens, we end up in the valley again. So we should be careful for our purposes today, I wish to submit that the highs we seek to capture lie mainly in these sectors, and I've tried to. Natural resources, of course, banking, manufacturing, ICT, and what I'd like to call industrial agriculture. In capturing the commanding heights, there is no more logical place to start than our natural resource base. These resources, you know, our gold, our diamond, manganese, bauxite, and now even oil, are all depleting assets. Depleting in the sense that they are irreplaceable. They are wasting assets. As, as we mine them, they get finished. And when they get finished, you no longer have the wealth. So it is important that we must seek to maximize our collective benefit from these God-given resources before they run out. I think everybody will agree with that, you know. They also, Michael talked about capital formation. They also offer some of the best ways to build capital and national wealth. If you have looked at the Dangote story, you know, everywhere that people have built great wealth, it has been on the back of some of these natural, natural uh, resources. And it's also an area in which we can empower and should empower Ghanaians. I mean, we have had, what, at least 120 or 50 years of mining in our, in our nation. And we have developed considerable human expertise in the area. There should be opportunities for qualified Ghanaians in concession ownership, leading to development of Ghanaian-owned mines. Let me tell you about uh, a suggestion I once made to a former head of state in Ghana. I say it because I think it's a model we should be thinking about using. I asked him, a foreign company had come and they were taking a, a new mine, they were developing a new mine. And I said, Mr. President, this was when I was uh, chairman of council, and one of the things I used to do, you know, when you are chairman of council, every once in a while you have these events where you shake hands, and sometimes you have the head of state there. And in my own mind, it didn't make sense that I was going to have the head of state sitting next to me for maybe two hours, and I would just sit quietly, and he sits quietly, and I say, yes, sir, yes, sir. So I would always plan that I have this man for the next two hours. After that, we are going to go for a short reception. As chairman, I have him, I have his undivided attention. So I will always plan, that's an opportunity. How I was going to use that opportunity. So I always had something planned. And on this occasion, my plan was to talk about natural resources, gold in particular. I said, Mr. President, why don't we put together a consortium of Ghanaians in order to look at our gold industry? And I have in mind the Ghanaians who took Ashanti public. You know, Ashanti Gold did a public listing, and they listed on uh, London, Toronto, the heart of mining, Melbourne, and New York, 
these days when I, when I hear people talk about, is it Jumia which has listed in New York and they are talking about it being the first billion dollar listing of an African company? That's not true. Ashanti Gold listed billion dollar listing in New York, what, all those years ago. So I said, and this was all run by Ghanaians from uh, Sir Sam Jonah, uh, Mr. Uredu, uh, uh, the lady lawyer. I mean, a group of Ghanaians, I mean, led this effort. And in the process, they gained some experience. So I said, why don't we get a concession and give it to these Ghanaians and tell them to build another shanty gold rather than keep giving the concessions to, to Ghanaians. He said, yes, I think that's a good idea. Um, so I quickly added, so shall I call them, you know, <laughs> get, get these Ghanaians together and arrange that they come and meet you? And he said, okay. So I remember I called uh, Mr. Redu. He's now at Goldfields or somewhere. We had, we had lunch together, like I'm going to have with Michael. At, uh, <laughs> and I put the idea to him. And he said, yes, yes, yes. So uh, he, will, he will look for uh, his colleagues with whom he, will, he, he, did, he did that, you know. I won't go into the story. But the point is that nothing came out of it, by the way. <laughs> but the point is that this is one way in which we talk about choosing winners. I mean, you can choose people. They may have been employees, but they have a track record of doing it. And particularly in the natural resource area, this is a place where we should do it. Of course, this may not apply in the, in the, in the, in the deep sea oil where the technology is very, very uh, uh, up to date and limited to a few companies worldwide. But for gold, bauxite, manganese, diamonds, I mean, these are areas in which we really have the expertise and we should be, we should be looking at it. But unfortunately, you see, the other side of this coin is that sometimes we have given concessions to Ghanaians only to see them turn them over to foreigners. Sometimes for a pittance. Even our small scale gold concessions, which don't require any extraordinary technology, end up in the hands of foreigners. And you know which foreigners mainly. <laughs> we need, and this is where it's important. Sometimes when we have, le we have had something experiences, we don't seem to learn a lesson from it. And, and uh, make the lessons legal. We need to make rules to avoid such occurrences. Small-scale mining should be better controlled and regulated. And we all know the Arab world began their development. The Dubais and Saudi Arabias of today were as poor as we were. They, 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 they began their development only after taking control of their oil and gas resources. I worked for BP. And I remember when uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, nationalized their, 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 their oil concessions, you know. But that was the beginning of today what the Arab world is. I mean, uh, uh, I remember uh, uh, Norway, when Norway got oil. Norway was not a much richer or better country than ours. But within, what, one generation, from the 70s up to now, when they discovered oil, they have used that oil to transform their country. So our gold, our manganese, and all these resources should be a source of capital formation. Of course, the question is, I mean, who, which Ghanaians should be empowered, and how should we choose them, and who should be granted the concessions, you know? Uh, uh, I have already made one suggestion. I'm sure you have other suggestions on how to pick uh, winners. An interesting um, aspect of this, of local control of natural resources, is the use of these natural resources as leverage for related infrastructure development. In these days of national hunger to develop a railway network, it may be useful to remind ourselves that the extension of the Western Rail Line from Takwa 
to Kumasi was financed with what was then called a revenue guarantee from the then Ashanti Goldfields. Yes, Ashanti Goldfields uh, gave a revenue guarantee of 30,000 pounds annually. What was this? All that it meant was that the company was guaranteeing that if you bring this railway, we will use and give you revenue of a minimum of 30,000 pounds annually. If we don't, we will still give you, we'll pay uh, that much to you. And that was the basis on which the financing for extending the railway from Takwa to Kumase was done. We need, we need to learn our history. We need to see what has been done before in our country. See what has gone right and copy it. And see what has gone wrong and improve and change it. You know. So this meant that the company used the, the services of the railway to the tune of at least that sum annually, I have already said. And such guarantees normally result in substantially lower cost of finance for construction. Akosombo Dam was built on the same model, if you remember. You know, Kaiser uh, uh, guaranteed that they would buy the power at a very, very cheap price, but it made the construction of the hydroelectric dam possible. So we must stop the kind of mining which destroys national infrastructure instead of enhancing it. Our current mining activities are destructive of both our road infrastructure and our environment. Look at the Takwa Takradi Road now. It's going. But natural resources should actually be enhancing our infrastructure rather than uh, destroying it if we know how to go about it. You know. Another good area to consider in any effort to capture the commanding heights of this economy is the finance industry, of course, especially banking. Without good, strong banks, we can't do anything. And the role of banks in the development of any economy is so critical that regulation of the sector and prudent management of the banking institutions must go hand in hand. I have followed keenly the developments in our banking industry in relation to the Ghanaian-owned banks which have failed or gone bad, you know. It is a most unfortunate and regrettable state of affairs that such a unique opportunity was given to some of our countrymen in the form of banking licenses, and they seem to have messed it up rather badly. Banks, by their very nature, must be conservative. Prudential requirements exist for good reason. Related party transaction rules must be respected and enforced. Collateral requirements must not be regarded lightly and waived without consideration for how loans and advances are to be secured. Single obligor limits, even for loans to government, must not be disregarded. Because banking experience, especially from South America, has demonstrated that even government loans can and do go bad. And liquidity support from the central bank must not become permanent. As an entrepreneur myself, I feel the pain of the founders and shareholders of the collapsed banks, sincerely because I know what it is like to start a business. But if some of them had been on liquidity support for years, as alleged, I dare to wonder if finding some method to save them would have been worthwhile. And I say this on behalf of all the other entrepreneurs and businesses in the country who have suffered the pain of high interest rates due to the poor governance of these banks. And I'm sure those of you in the finance sector recognize that the cause of our high interest rates must have been also due to the poor performance of these banks. It translates definitely into high interest rates and the rates, if we want 7%, you need properly governed banks in order to arrive at that kind of interest rates. Businesses could not assess loans because banks are alleged to have been giving loans to their own related companies. In discussing the collapse of these banks, we must remember the many other businesses which collapsed 
because of the unprofessional activities of these banks. Of course, there are some locally owned banks who have acted professionally and continue to operate. We need to grow such banks because well-managed locally owned big banks are crucial to capturing the commanding heights of our economy. Our banks must be solid enough to finance what the bankers call big ticket items. Over the years, there has been attempts like the Ghana Business Promotion Act of 1970, the Investment Policy Decree of 1975, to legislate Ghanaians into ownership of companies started by foreigners. Companies like Glexting West Africa, I don't know if you remember them, Mem Timbers, I don't know if you remember them, were acquired for Ghanaians under some of these legislations. Unfortunately, they were run aground. Outmoded business models were maintained when it was clearly no longer appropriate. And my favorite, I have a favorite example I give, and that is the AG Leventis and UAC example. Before independence, there were two groups in Ghana, AG Leventis, which was Greek-owned, and then there was UAC, which was owned by Anglo-Dutch, right? And they were competing in this country. At independence, our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, said, look, Ghanaians have to capture the commanding heights of our economy. As part of that process, he formed uh, Ghana Commercial Bank, right? In addition, he took over AG Leventis, paid them and took over the company and made it a state-owned company and renamed it GNTC, Ghana National Trading Corporation. The two groups were in the same lines of business. They each had a, a big supermarket. UAC had a Kingsway stores. Uh, 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 AG Leventis had what we call Ghana House. I don't know if you remember. They also had a supermarket there. Uh, these people were representing uh, some beer manufacturers. These people were also representing some beer manufacturers. They had textile divisions. These people had textile divisions. They were, they were two competing groups. I mean, uh, uh, conglomerates, as it were. Today, what has happened to UAC? UAC has developed metamorphosed and is now Unilever. Unilever used to be just a single division of UAC. But as time changed, they changed the business model, they changed the methods of doing things, they sold Kingsway stores, they sold all their properties, and have become a manufacturing, huge manufacturing concern, Unilever. What has happened to AG Leventis, and our, which became our own GNTC. There's no, no, no proper evidence of GNTC existing now. What was the difference between the two companies? One was state-owned, one was privately owned. But both were run by Ghanaians, if you understand me. My time is up. I'm only halfway through. <laughs> I mean, a uh, guest speaker should have some privileges. <laughs> I'll cut it short. You know, the important thing is both groups were run by Ghanaians. Indeed, the transformation of UAC was spearheaded by a gentleman called Ishmael Yamsen. He effectively changed UAC into Unilever. The whole strategy is, I've asked him to write about it. I don't know if he, he I hope he is, he is writing about it. So when I talk about changes in business model and things, the only difference is that one was state owned. And that is why we need to find Ghanaians to own these things. When you are privately owned, you try to change with the, with the, with the, with the times, you know. But, the point of this is that this is an especially difficult problem in the manufacturing sector. And you need visionary management and technical skills for efficient and continuous operation. And we need to face the fact that as a country, we have not been efficient and successful in manufacturing. If it's cultural, we'll have that, that discussion. 
You know, manufacturing is a sector which transforms economies, provides mass employment, and it gives a reliable source of revenue to governments. Our analysis of the issues in this sector has to be honest and sincere if we are to seize the undoubted opportunities in manufacturing. We have embraced local content rules, which is an important start, but only to the extent that they are rigorously enforced. As at now, I cannot vouch for such enforcement in all the sectors covered by the regulations. I mean, I must make an exception for the oil sector. I think that some very genuine efforts at uh, enhancing local content is going on. But that is not the only sector which has local content rules. And we need to look very seriously at enforcement. Now, there is no doubt that ICT, you know, has become one of the major heights in any economy at any time, especially in these times. But in a, in a scenario for me, eerily similar to the banking sector, Ghanaian-owned companies in the telecom and ICT sector seem to have also run into problems. Remember NCS? They were the first internet service provider in uh, West Africa, at least, if not in all of Africa. Remember Celtel, Casapa, Espresso? They have all disappeared. I mean, these were one of the few indigenous companies to obtain mobile telephone licenses. Another one was MTN. But the MTN guy, uh, I think it was Ariba or something. I mean, it's gone through Scancom, I think it was. Space phone, was it? When he got the license, he leveraged it, or he flipped it, to a foreign company. And today, MTN is a multi-billion dollar industry. But that opportunity was or originally given to a Ghanaian. Is there something cultural we need to, we need to, we need to look at? And the Kasapas and the cell tells which have collapsed, you know, uh, 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 um, consumers just switched to the more efficient companies. There was no public outcry about destroying Ghanaian businesses. No bailouts were required. No liquidity support was given to them. And believe me, you can give liquidity support to anybody you want. It's not just to banks, if you think it worthwhile. You know, and in the meantime, MTN, whose operational license, like I said, was acquired by a Ghanaian and promptly passed on to foreigners, has to become a billion dollar industry. In fact, the state owned telecom company, Ghana Telecom, with the benefit of hindsight, seems to have profited from being diverted into majority foreign private partnership, ownership. How can we capture the commanding highs in the telecom sector then? when we don't seem to be doing well. I have one solution. I'm sure you will have other solutions. But I think that we should make it imperative and insist on a listing of a substantial block of their shares on the local stock exchange, and then further insist that those shares should be limited uh, to only Ghanaians, something like that. You know, if we cannot run it ourselves, we should find a way of letting other people run it and we enjoy part of the benefits, you know. So I still think that our choice of who we give such opportunities to is important. And we need to take a closer look at how such unique licenses, banking licenses, uh, multi, uh, telecom licenses, how they are giving out and the, and the process. You know, there is a responsibility on Ghanaians who wish to be part of the capture force. Running a business requires discipline and focus. It also requires nationalism and selflessness. Our business people must not count their chickens before they are hatched, and definitely not eat them as eggs. <laughs> Sometimes we are too eager to show the signs of success when we have barely made it out of the starting blocks. This attitude is not helped by the multiplicity of awards which seek to give accolades too early. Indeed, the award system has become an industry in its own right. It may be time to regulate this award industry 
and limit them maybe to a few credible ones. The agric industry is another of the highest we need to capture, if only for the strategic imperative of feeding ourselves, but also providing agricultural raw material for processing. And this is an especially difficult area to attract young people into. We need, we need some very good steps to do it. First, we must approach it as an industry. And not at the peasant level, one acre, two acre thing that we, we, we do, you know. Secondly, land accessibility, as in land banks, the same we do for industry. You do a, an industrial zone and you give it to people. Why don't we do the same also for agri? Thirdly, soil investigations and uh, extension services. Agricultural now is industrial, it's scientific. Even before you plant, you have analyzed the soil. You know not just what will grow there, but what extra nutrients you need to put into that soil in order to maximize the yield of whatever you are going to grow there. And we need to do all these things. And then, for me, the most important policy which we need to give to our young people in agri is a guaranteed minimum price. I'll tell you why. I mean, agriculture is the one industry where the higher your yield, the less money you are left with at the end of the day. Because if there is a maize bumper harvest, what happens? The price of maize collapses. So the following year, what is the incentive for you to expand your acreage? So agriculture, agricultural success is self-defeating in a way. And the way countries have handled it, knowing that you still need the food, you still need it for your raw material, is to guarantee the farmer that no matter what happens, no matter how big the harvest, I will pay you this minimum amount of money. And that amount must be set to give the farmer not just a profit, a profit higher than what he would have got if he had put his money in the bank. Or his, You must make it attractive. That, those are the areas where you need liquidity support. And you give that guaranteed minimum price. So all that the young farmer going in knows, has to know is that if I can produce 5,000 tons of maize, I'm going to get $5 million. That's all he needs to worry about. And that is the way all the countries, from the EU, from the US, that is the, the way they have all revolutionized agriculture. You cannot revolutionize agriculture without a guaranteed minimum price. Let me, at this point, just take a few minutes and talk about the use of laws to capture the commanding heights. We have already spoken about local content rules, local participation rules, you know, and public procurement rules. I mean, in most places, these laws should be enough to ensure a vibrant economic activity for locals. But as already mentioned, exemptions, lack of enforcement have conspired to minimize the effect of these laws. Let me try and bring this to an end. We need to identify, encourage, and empower Ghanaians, especially those with a credible track record. These are the people who will, on all our behalfs, capture the commanding highs and provide the benefits, like we say, by way of jobs and tax revenue. A note of caution. In identifying such credible people, we must be worried. We must be careful of people who appear successful, but are in reality merely benefiting from what we call economic rent. People who don't bring any value, either of, of, of a track record, of an ability in some way, but just because they happen to know somebody, the, thing, the kind of thing we call crony, you know, and we give them the opportunities. Yes, they will get it, but it won't translate into the kind of multiplier effect that you want in an, in an economy. I have no doubt that there are private sector operatives in Ghana today, especially among the many educated young members of our populace who have all the skills required to capture and keep the commanding highs. Let us nurture and encourage them to team up into multi-skilled groups 
And please, let's give them a chance. Thank you very much.